calling in my paper visualizing data a, a journey from calculator development to the machine shop and the um, it's too bad the PowerPoint isn't working here because I wanted to share some some slides with you uh, but I could give you a little bit of background of why this journey happened and why Hewlett Packard uh, was involved was involved at the outset and uh, then I'll carry on for the benefit of, of some of those folks that were actually in my uh, shop at home back in the 2008 conference, um, I want to share with you and, and, and some of our new friends here uh, what's happened since then and what, what a new project is. Um, so I will do my own uh, uh, I will do my own attempt at, at PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so if all else fails, you use a uh, uh, a manual backup, and and uh, Jake, your viewers will go dizzy if you try to zoom in on that too much. Um, my my father's a physicist, and he made his career in studying the properties of uh, superfluid liquid helium. And he and Joe Vinan at uh, in Birmingham basically founded the field of uh, of studying quantum turbulence in, in superfluid helium. And when you grow up the son of a physicist and Dad comes home every night talking about cool lab equipment. Pretty soon, you want to go to the lab with your dad, and and so a great deal of my youth was uh, spent um, in the cryogenics laboratory, first sweeping the floor and then earning the right to file literature, and finally getting to design apparatus and build software for it along the way. And uh, in um, many of you guys here are familiar with the HP desktop computers and so in the back of the room there is a, an HP 85 and the predecessor to that thing came out of Fort Collins division right here in Colorado and that's the, the 9845 computer my father actually had all the desktop models at one time or another um, he started with the 9100 which I still have and uh, um, he had the 9815 and the 25 um, he skipped the 35 he bought a 9845S. The magic really was two things in this time period. The first was that uh, between the Fort Collins and the Loveland divisions of Hewlett Packard, this very, very strong product line of instrumentation came out which could be tied together and automated with uh, what's called the HPIB bus or the IEEE 488 standard. HP was one of the contributors to that that standard and in the physics lab what what we had was the problem of managing <coughs> experimental data that was collected with these desktop computers and that led me on the first part of my journey in, in visualizing data and on this slide uh, if if you could see it uh, you'll see some plots from uh, pen plotters here uh, that are in a in a paper that was published about the properties of superfluid helium. Now, the, the magic here was that the, the synthesis of the instrumentation and the desktop computer allowed us to get publication quality data in real time, which was never before possible, because normally you would hand draw your graph and then send it down to the lady down the hall and she'd spend eight weeks and then give you back an incorrect version of a pen and ink drawing and then you'd miss your publication deadline and people would run around in circles. And so instead we introduced the concept of software defects in plotting software that made the trip from experimental data to an incorrect plot much more efficient. <laughs> oh wait a minute, did I say that? Um, so. Um, there, there were a couple of interesting things about that. One of the one of the items in the HP uh, product line was a digitizer with a little pen. We wrote a software package that would let you digitize plots uh, from papers published uh, before digital data was available electronically, and we used that to synthesize experimental results with previously published results and see how things lined up. Um, and it 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 was it was. Uh, rather amazing. Um, still no PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, I'll just fake it. Um, so during this period of time, um, 
in 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 the lab there were uh, again this would be wonderful if it was up on the screen but it is, it is. oh is it awesome yay okay let's let's go to there, we can okay uh go to jump down a couple of slides so this this is the model and this is who jim is but you guys have figured that out by now so we can we can go on from there um this is the lab apparatus um the, the thing to highlight here is that Russ's lab was a museum of HP equipment, and it's it still is. Is this one of these high-tech things with like a button or something? That's okay. some old stuff. Um, what you're seeing here, however, uh, is is a tad more complex than you might believe. This is actually a rotating table for cryogenic experiments, where you have a cryostat in the center, and you have a, a super, column of superfluid helium. <coughs> Uh, that you're doing some experiments in, and that uh, what was particularly amazing about that was that uh, on the you, you just can't see it in this picture because there's a, a table in the way, but uh, the table was made out of an old World War II lathe faceplate that is about uh, six or seven feet in diameter. It must have been a giant metal lathe for making warships or something. Um, but underneath there is a set of slip rings, and we were able to get the HPIB bus signals to go through those slip rings. And so now we were doing automation of data collection uh, in, in this apparatus uh, with the HPIB bus going right through the slip rings onto something rotating up to maybe 50 RPM. And uh, the, the fact that the HPIB bus was resilient enough to survive that transition it's certainly a testament to the engineers that made the interface cards, um, and uh, we were we were very grateful for that. Next slide. Um, so these are the publication plots that I was talking about. I just scanned these out of an old reprint in a hurry the other day. Uh, but what I wanted to get you to see was that with the 9845 as a controller, uh, we were getting these plots. Um, off the apparatus right away, and that was a tremendous breakthrough. Nobody else in the in the physics department had automation, anything like that. So, when the HP 85 was introduced, um, I, I was rather blown away. I was just out of college and still reasonably broke, um, but I uh, heard about the 85 and bought the first one possible the day before it's an official introduction uh, by begging and pleading at the Apple store. And uh, that was the gateway to my joining HP because they hired me to write some solution book software. Um, so that was, my, that was my entry into HP. So visualizing data became not only the, the seed of my interest in all of this, but it also got me a career, which was really pretty cool because I got to meet some absolutely amazing people along the way. That's the next slide. Um, so, why am I interested in a machine shop? How does that go in? Um, this guy, Tom O'Donnell, was a scientific instrument maker at the University of Chicago. And uh, what he's working on here is a variant on a Michelson interferometer. And he was the mentor to this guy, who was Jim Radistitz, who was my father's instrument maker for most of my father's career. And uh, this guy up here is Bernie, and uh, there's a picture of them in the machine shop there at the University of Oregon. And that's where I spent a good deal of my youth, was in there annoying those guys, trying to learn how to run a lathe, and generally being underfoot. Um, let's go back one slide. Um, the, the coup de grace for this, this team of guys here is this cryostat. That is a uh, helium-3 infrared telescope sensor. Uh, weighs 21 pounds. It can hold uh, helium-3 at uh, 30 microkelvin for 21 hours straight with no auxiliary equipment. And we flew that on a Coupier observatory uh, out over the Pacific and flew it in the back of fighter jets. We flew it on balloons. Um, and uh, the purpose was to calibrate uh, the upper atmosphere moisture so that our experiments in infrared astronomy from the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii would be properly calibrated. And that particular instrument calibrated the temperature of Saturn's rings 
uh, to mm -hmm. a standard that's never been duplicated, including by the aircraft that went by. I mean, they're, they're just uh, rock solid. Uh, this guy, Jim Redistitz, uh made that and taught me a fair bit along the way about how things go together and would I please get out of his way because my dad wants him to hurry up. Um, uh, uh, but uh, Jim died quite a number of years ago uh, and to my astonishment, about 10 years after his death, his daughter says, you need to come over to the house. And she gave me all of JVR's tooling, measuring instruments and everything. Uh, and so there's times when I'm out in my shop and I'm using one of JVR's tools and I can hear him from heaven laughing at me going, you dummy, you don't do it that way. <laughs> um, but, but these are sort of the heritage of, of this uh, combination of interests. Let's go to the next slide. So I got to put this all together again in the HP calculator product line in uh, uh, 1985 when the Loveland Instrument Division down the road did the 3421 data collector. And this was arguably one of the more fun and entertaining uh, projects. Uh, there are friends that I met down here in Colorado that I correspond with to this day uh, who were involved in the Loveland side of this project. But this this is all battery powered, well, with the obvious exception of the video monitor, this is battery powered data collection. Uh, and to be able to do that uh, in those years was, a, I thought, a fairly astonishing uh, capability. Um, that ROM was the uh, data acquisition, the data acquisition ROM. Um, so after the data acquisition pack project, I migrated on to uh, different calculator projects. And um, some of you will remember there was this obscure thing called the HP 48. Um, and uh, I had a great deal of fun uh, with that. Um, what I regret not putting a screen capture in here is the periodic table of the elements. Uh, Mega Sean and Eric Vogel and I put that application together. And I really think it's one of the earliest graphical representations of the periodic table that was ever done on a, on a computing device. Uh, I certainly won't claim it's the first because I don't have any way of verifying that, but it was sure early in the game. Um, but in, in the little uh, programming booklet I wrote for the 48, I combined some of the interests of uh, chaos research at the University of Oregon with the graphics and put these as programming examples in, in the book. And a uh, number of years later, I realized that the HP 48 had one, one last stand in uh, graphical output, and that was 3D. And uh, um, regrettably, uh, the, the result doesn't survive, and neither does the code, but I spent several days looking for them and was disappointed I couldn't find them. But I, what I did is I took the 48G and taught it how to generate CNC G code um, with parametric plot and had it machine out a parametric plot on a piece of cherry wood. <laughs> and uh, um, that was really fun. That was about 2002 when, when I did that. And uh, I, I really wanted to have that lock here to hand around, and I just couldn't find it. <laughs> but I'm grateful that at least I have the picture of it. So, um, so back back to those HP 48 examples. There there is a an artifact to living in Oregon called winter. <laughs> And trees seem to lose their leaves for a while. And you know, after you drive back and forth in gray weather looking at bare tree branches against a gray sky, um, you begin to lose your mind. And my way of doing that this year was to realize that um, I had done this fractal tree uh, example in the HP 48 handbook. And I thought, gosh, you know, that was, that was kind of fun. Maybe we should do that in aluminum. And uh, so after staring at these uh, trees by where I parked my car at work, I said, that's it. And, and uh, took the fractal tree program and converted it uh, so that it would generate G-codes. And uh, the result is here. Um, and so 
what is what, what that started. I'm going to hand several things around. This will be the first. I'd be very, very grateful if they came back to me. Um, uh, so this this began a, a journey that I, I absolutely did not anticipate um, as the synthesis of computer-generated data and my love of, of processes in the machine shop began to synthesize with, with each other. Um, one other artifact of learning how to engrave in aluminum was that with all the software available on the web, you can take a picture and convert it into boundaries and machine notes. So there's Van Gogh's Starry Night engraved in aluminum, um, which I don't think is a is a uh, everyday occurrence. Um, so I'll hand those around. Um, at about the same time, a friend of mine came to me and said that he was having trouble with an HP01 watch that was in uh, his possession. His father had passed away and he got it back. And he was terrified that the batteries were still in it and they would be bad. And did I have a battery door removal tool? Well, now we do. Um, so I measured the back of the 01 and uh, I made these uh, little tools for opening the back battery door. Um, turns out that the geometry of the back door of the HP01 doesn't match a standard watch removal tool very well. Huh. And uh, so I made a bunch of these, and uh, there's a couple up on the prize table that somebody will win. Um, along the way, I was also learning about lettering, and it turns out that um, carving 3D lettering into aluminum is a lot harder than you think. This was one of the vehicles I used as an experiment. Um, that's an anagram from Newton, which is his attempt to document his invention of calculus. And you can type that anagram into Google and, and, and learn all about it. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, there is another project that, that kicked off um, about this time, and I got the crazy idea that because I was learning to engrave uh, characters into aluminum, that I wanted to make a reproduction of Napier's bones. So here today I am announcing um, the very, this, you guys will be the first to see it. This was finished at 4.30 Thursday morning. Um, I made Napier's bones out of uh, aluminum in a wooden box for them. And uh, so that has a user interface. And uh, it's made up out of, out of sticks of rod. And before I open this up, I just want to point out that, you know, I brought four of these in my suitcase. And I didn't think that the uh, airport people would be excited about that. But, you know, if you think about what a bunch of sticks of metal look like in an x-ray machine, maybe I should have done the math. So I have this very nice card in my suitcase that said, we've rummaged through all your stuff. And I have this Transportation Security Administration <laughs> sticker on this box that is saying that, by golly, they've inspected this. And I'm, I'm sure that they're very puzzled about what that could be. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I have a, an ambition for my retirement, which includes, um, uh, after I stop working at HP, which people tell me I will eventually do, um, I want to have a few things to sell on my website. So you guys are seeing for the very first time what will become the second product on my website, and this is Napier's Boons. And so I'm going to hand this around. Um, so let me, uh, I'm running out of hands, uh, but underneath, so there's a little booklet here, but yeah. So what, what, what John Napier did was he published, in 1617 he published this little book called Rudology, and, and what it describes is a, is a way to do multiplication. And it's based on the old Arab lattice arithmetic trick that had been around for quite some time. And um, these rods have, um, this whole thing comes out of the box and there's this little board that holds the rods. The rods have columns of numbers on them. And there's a very clever way to do multiplication and division with these things, and also to pull cube roots and square roots. And so if you really want to impress somebody in a bar, um, you can pull a cube root with, uh, with Napier's rods. What I will 
Um, now, what's very interesting about this thing is that there, there's a, a staggering similarity to what was going on in the early 17th, 17th century here and what we see today. For one thing, he, he published and open sourced this idea. And it got translated into a number of languages. And, and it was actually used for quite a number of years. And, and in his paper, he points out user interface optimizations. And so on the ends of the rods, what you will see are uh, the digits for the columns. The columns are, are reversed. You have to flip the rod over to find the nines complement of the, of the column you were just looking at. And Napier points out that, you know, if you're really fussy about checking your multiplication, that there's another algorithm that you can apply to get you back around to the original result simply by turning your answer over. Um, I'm not sure that the HP calculator software does that anymore. Um, but I, one, of, one of the interesting discoveries about all of this is that people took this idea and ran with it. So just as in the early evolution of the PC and the new models coming out, or the early introduction of a calculator followed by new models, new models of this arrangement of doing multiplication also came out. And people competed to see, you know, I've got a cooler version than you do. Um, and, and so it, it's just a striking, uh, a striking similarity. And it's also very unusual to have a tactile uh, physical experience when you're, when you're doing math. It's something that I didn't really understand until a few days ago how compelling this was going to be until I finally had made it and, and had it working. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, where else is the shop going in visualization and, and with math and graphics and so on? Well, Johannes Kepler published a, a hypothesis in, at the end of the of the 16th century, basically saying, hey, you know, you might be able to explain the spacing of planetary orbits as nested platonic solids. Mm. And he, he has this sketch in there of, um, that, that has, has these uh, laid out uh, on, a, on a fancy base. And I thought, since I was a child, I thought I'd like to have one of those. And now um, it exists. Uh, I got a, a friend to build a solid model out of that, and we have a staggering amount of time and money sunk into this. Um, uh, a magnitude, you know, a couple of K. Um, and, and so it's been 3D printed and it's sitting in my shop. And I would like someday for that to be available to people. The problem is that this is a, this is a, soft, a, a, a part design that is uh, a little bit ahead of its time. Um, it can be printed with enough detail to see all the way down to the inner orbits. But the cost of printing that thing is prohibitive. So you can only print it with an, uh, an SLS process in metal, and uh, those prints would run anywhere from two to three thousand dollars. And I'd like it to get down to two or three hundred dollars eventually. Um, so as the the 3D printers evolve then I think that this will become something that, that people could have at, a, at an affordable price. Uh, but moreover, it's, it's just fun to take this guy's vision and realize it in 3D and see it sitting in front of you. Um, and so um, the, the challenge that I want to throw down to the HP calculator team, um, and uh, Surreal, I'm speaking to you now, uh, it's, it's another challenge um, I, I would like to propose that over time the HP calculators be able to output an STL file of a parametric plot so that they could be, the results could be printed in 3D. I think that's, it's a, a strikingly simple file format to write and all the data is there. So I'll, I'll throw down the gauntlet to the community here at large um, that uh, Someday, an HP calculator ought to generate. Uh, Jeremy's waving back there. He's all over it. Okay, good. Uh, but somebody ought to be able to generate uh, a, a 3D printable STL file from a calculator result. And then I think we'll have really gone the extra step in visualizing data with HP calculators. Thank you very much. Continue making some of the HPL1 
back opening tools as well? I know there's something there, but I bet that there's a demand for that. Um, I, I strongly suspected that the entire world community of people wanting HP01 battery door removal tools might be in this room. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not very often that you introduce an accessory for a calculator introduced in 1977, but today's the day. Any other? Yes. On the Thank you. Very beautiful work, by the way. Um, on the, the aluminum plates on this, did, were they designed on the HP 40, 48, or did, was that, did that serve as an inspiration for these designs? Um, no, they were done in it. Uh, no, the, the aluminum engraving um, is mostly done in a CAD system. Um, all the tooling pads are hand carved. Um, if you, so a little machine shop geekery here. Um, if you lay out a true type font in the CAD system and you just say pocket it out with a small end mill, you'll get an extremely inefficient cutting path. Hmm. And so um, that on that little line of letters that's going around, that's Newton's anagrams, um, if you let a CAD package uh, lay out a tooling path for you, it'll take a half hour to cut. Well, cutting aluminum is a ballet of bending and breaking metal. And once you've spent enough time in it, you realize how much you can get away with by taking advantage of aluminum's ability to misbehave. So I've got the machining time for that little set of numbers down to probably about eight or nine minutes now. Um, another interesting thing about Newton's anagram there, I, I did that because I was, I was reading a book. Uh, I have this fascination for making things that generate a conversation and I thought gee you know if that thing was sitting on some random person's desk in the engineering lab that's going to start a conversation because it's not in hex right if it was in hex somebody would think oh that's somebody's good and, and move along but it's not in hex and so I gave one to my friend's wife who works at Intel she left it on the uh, on her desk and apparently has shut down the department for an afternoon <laughs> while research. and that's the reaction I wanted is it's something that you see that you don't expect that starts a conversation. Um, but as, uh, at, at some point, if, uh, um, you know, if calculators can render STL files, um, it's really not without reason that a font could be rendered as well in a negative relief, and then a calculator certainly could do that um, as an STL file. <clears throat> That's called a complex serial, to say. Any, what do you use to blacken the? What do you use to blacken the, the letters after they've been engraved? To blacken the letters, um, I use a self etching primer by a company called SEM, oh. and um, boy does it stink! Uh, but it dries really, really fast. Huh. Um, and then you sand off the top of the thing oh, and polish it with a scotch brake wheel. Huh. Jake, just real quick, I I bet there's a good number of people in this room that do not know relationship between your dad and the HP 35 and I just thought maybe you oh, said a sentence um, about that. Jake was, yeah, my, my, my father was actually standing in the HP sales office in Wilsonville, Oregon when the HP 35 was announced and uh, Carmen West, who became the marketing manager uh, at, at HP in the Corvallis division was at that time this one of the girls working in the sales division and uh, they were all, everybody in the sales office had, conversation had stopped because Bill Hewlett was making an announcement and dad looked over at Carmen and said I'll take one and so Carmen said you know well that's a customer and faxed in the purchase order and it turned out to be the first one submitted um, and uh, um, so there were 18 sold on the first day and that's one of them okay thank you